Hi everyone, this is Jennifer Hinke. I'm the laboratory manager at the Coachella Valley Mosquito and Vector Control District. You're watching the video for our CEQA training. We're gonna go over some things like what is CEQA, what does the district do, what does our program look like, and how we each do our jobs the best so that we can ensure that we're compliant with the law. Ready to get started? Let's go. So CEQA is formally known as the California Environmental Quality Act. We know that in California, we have beautiful landscapes and all sorts of interesting and amazing plants and animals. And there is a desire to protect that, to ensure that that is there for a long period of time, well after any of us are here. And that means that um, all agencies like ours, all public agencies have to adopt a program for monitoring or reporting on revisions of the, the program, which it has required in a project and the measures it has imposed to mitigate or avoid significant environmental effects. This means when we look at the work that we're doing at the district, which we do lots of things of driving to different sites, collecting mosquitoes and bringing them out of the environment, killing mosquitoes, killing fire ants, trapping flies, all of the work that we do has the potential to have a negative impact on the environment. When the district record reviewed all of the things that we do as part of our routine work for the integrated vector management program, all of the work that we do, we thought, you know what, there is likelihood that we're going to have a negative impact on the environment. But we also think that we can do a lot of things to reduce that impact so that it would be zero. So when I say that we can have a negative impact on the environment, let's look at what the 2020 numbers look like. So we do a review every year of everything it is that we did. And in 2020 alone, there are 24,790 entries in our mobile system for mosquito control applications that were made. That is mostly larval mosquito control applications, but it includes the 80s applications. It does not include the wide area larvicide applications that were made in La Quinta and Palm Desert. And it does not include the ULV applications for um, bringing down Culex mosquito numbers or for um, responsive virus applications or barrier applications that were made. So already a lot of applications, but some others that have to be included as well. As far as the surveillance group, they collected more than 600,000 mosquitoes and brought those out of the environment. And you can think that those mosquitoes could be a food source for other animals. We also treated more than 11,000 acres for fire ants. And these are kind of routine numbers for us. They're, they're pretty in line with previous years. Um, and so you can see that year on year, all of this work that we all do together can have this impact on the environment. So there are lots of ways that we can reduce our potential impacts. And specifically, if you look at the sequel report, there are 18 different measures that are outlined in statute in the law that we know that we potentially have an impact on the environment and that we can do something specifically to reduce our impact. 18's a lot, um, but I think they grew up, group out really well in about five areas and about five things and kind of these three areas. One of those is um, through our routine trainings, it shows how we're compliant with these laws and the regulations that, that govern our work. We review very specifically the work that we're doing in conservation areas. Are we doing what we have to do? And are we using all of the options that we have in an integrated vector management program? And then specifically, are we using our ATVs appropriately to avoid damage to wildlife? And then finally, showing the evidence that we are using the best practices that are available to us. This includes working with researchers that are developing solutions here that we implement. And then specifically, as you review the CEQA report, you'll notice that there are lots of things about mosquito fish. And so I'm gonna cover each of these a little bit more in detail so that you have an idea about what's going on as you review the report. 
we all attend lots of routine trainings and we do that because it's required to, but it also is required to because those are the things that best protect the environment. We know that we've been attending N-series training labels and safety data sheets. We review the district recommended rates so that we know that we're having um, an impact on the mosquitoes or on the fire ants, but we're hopefully not having an impact on other things in the environment. We attend spill prevention training, safe pesticide handling training, respirator fit test so that we can protect ourselves and preventing heat stress. We also, as part of this report, include the files on the attendance for all of the continuing education units that we all do to maintain our certifications. These are all excellent ways of showing that we understand what the laws are, that we know what we're supposed to be doing, and that we can follow those. Those are not the only things that we do for compliance. There's lots of report writing that's done by a lot of people here at the district. So this includes the monthly reports of pesticide use to the Ag Commissioner. Um, and this is a place where technicians often are putting in input in the mobile system and those have to get corrected so that we get an accurate tally every month of what we used and can report that correctly to the Agricultural Commissioner. We have to include in our annual CEQA report uh, maps of where we know that mosquitoes and other vectors may be. So this means maps of all the mosquito sources that we know about in the valley and all of the places that we know have the potential for red imported fire ants. Uh, maps of the treatments of those sources. So sometimes a place that was a source um, in one year was not treated in the following year because it, it wasn't a source that year. So we, we have two different sets of maps for that. We need to include all of the standard operating procedures for our district threshold. So you know that, for instance, when you go to do larval dips in a duck club pond, there's a threshold of how many mosquitoes should be in your dips before you make a treatment. And so we keep a copy of all of those for somebody that wants to know what it is that we use as our threshold to treat. In this annual review of the work, there's a report on our, uh, our um, safety procedures and anything that, that took us away from being safe. There's a report on the quality control, um, all of the evaluations that that group does. And there's a report on environmental compliance. So a, a report on what we did for instance with NPDES um, or other issues that may have come up. This report also includes any inspections that are made by the California Department of Public Health with whom we have a cooperative agreement. You can see a snapshot of part of the um, review that was made in 2019. Um, this also includes our inspections by the Ag Commissioner when they come out to inspect any technician that's out in the field or they come by the district headquarters and inspect us. So you can see we do lots of things um, to be compliant with lots of other laws and the California Environmental Quality Act report that we do um, takes advantage of all the other things that we're already doing and shows what it is that we're doing. So we're not adding new things on top of what we were already doing. One thing that we do add on top of what we were already doing is looking at um, the conservation areas. So there are 18 different designated conservation areas across the valley. Um, this is a, a image that's zoomed in on one of those closer to the Salton Sea. And every year there's a review of the applications that are made, particularly in those areas, um, and make sure that we can call out what happened in any of those conservation areas specifically. So in 2020, we made 210 applications of larvicides to 43 sites that were within a, one of those conservation areas. We also had 17 ULV applications and seven barrier applications. Um, and uh, in addition, there is a um, conservation area that has a private residence that's within that conservation area. And uh, we did make a application for fire ant control within that, uh, that application area. We do keep all of these on file if anybody is interested in, in seeing those. Um, and that's something that I can share with you if you're interested. With regards to our ATV and UTV use, those of you that have been with us for a longer period of time um, know that there's, there's, there are the best ways to use the ATV to, to reduce our impact on the environment. We're looking to use already established trails 
We're looking to not make things bigger. Um, we're looking um, particularly during the months of, of March through June, so March, April, May, and June, when birds are breeding, to be very careful with our use around um, the shoreline areas and around where birds may be nesting. And as you look through your district cares manual, um, that manual includes a list of all of the animals that we have uh, identified within the area and plants within the area that are what are known as state listed or federally listed species. By that, I mean that they are federally or state endangered or threatened. There's not many of them. We are protecting them and we don't want to cause any harm to them. We happen to have lots of those animals in the valley and you'll see as you flip through the book, there are lots of birds and that is because we are part of that Pacific Flyway where there's lots of migration that goes um, up and down the Pacific coast um, and the Salton Sea is an area where lots of birds will stop and rest and, and fly on. But there are plenty that come and breed um, and make nests in the springtime and we want to make sure that those nests are successful, that those baby birds grow all the way up to be adults and that they can fly away. In order to show that we are compliant with not causing harm to the environment, one of the things that we do in our annual review of the work is that we look at all of the applications that are made using ATVs by reviewing the key log. So every time a technician signs out the ATVs, um, they say where they're going with it. Um, and then with that, uh, we look at the number of, of times that we're going into duck club habitat or shoreline habitat, particularly in these months. We also want to review our training every year, um, particularly making sure that we know what we're doing, that we know how to, to use our ATV safely, and we know how to have the least amount of impact on the environment that we can. Uh, what you can see on here um, are a few of those bird species that we're really concerned about. There's, there's quite a few, um, but at the top um, is our, uh, our diurnal owl. Owing owl. Um, over to the um, right, the gray bird, that's one of our gray vireos, um, and at the bottom is a summer tanager. One of the animals that we also know that's in our habitat um, here and is very endangered is the desert pupfish. Um, and they are found in the seeps and the canals along the Salton Sea. They are an egg-laying fish. Um, they're about three inches long. They're normally tan to olive with these five to eight vertical bars you can see on the, the top picture. But the males will be bright blue when it's the breeding season. And one of the very cool things about desert pupfish is that they're just they're just gorgeous to look at, but they also do eat mosquitoes. Um, and so they are where they already are. They're they're a great um, thing for for our work, and that we wouldn't have mosquitoes in those same habitats. But mosquito fish, which are the, the fish that we have here at the district and that we put out in different places, they will eat the desert pupfish eggs. And so we have written out in our monitoring report that we will not add mosquito fish to places that we know are desert pupfish habitat. And you can see here that there are several that we do know about. Ponds at the Living Desert. There's a pond at the UCR Palm Desert Campus for the seeps and the canals around the Salton Sea. Ponds at the Thousand Palms Preserve. The small pond that's behind the Salton Sea State Park headquarters used to have desert pupfish, I think it still does, and the waters at the Dos Palmas Preserve. Really, what we are allowed to do is to add fish to private property only. So, an abandoned swimming pool behind somebody's house that's not being maintained the way it needs to be is private property. Uh, open channel that goes down into the Salton Sea is probably not, and so we should not be adding mosquito fish there. This is lined out for us in the California Code Title 14, Section 
F. And Riverside County is one of the few counties that's listed out specifically that we cannot add fish to public property or to unowned property, but it needs to be private property. So as I said at the beginning of this, we do a review of all of the work that was done across the, the district. <laughs> what happens then? Well, it's summarized into a report and I've provided you a copy with that. Um, it is presented at a board meeting and it is filed for anyone who would like a copy. What I've given you is the summary of that report, just kind of the, the highlights of things that happened. But there are a number of documents that you saw listed here that, that go along with that. Um, and so if there's somebody that would like that, um, it is quite a bit of paper, but it is something that we can provide to somebody that is asking for it. What I hope I've impressed upon you is that um, your work matters in ensuring that the district is compliant with all the things that we're doing. And it is really important. And there are things that you do that make it easier for us to maintain our compliance. Making reports of the applications that you're making into the mobile accurately is really helpful. It means that we know that when somebody asks what kinds of applications we're making, we can easily provide them with that information and we don't have to spend time correcting things later. Reporting problems and overtreatments to your su supervisor quickly and when it happens is really important. In some cases, there may be a need to file a report with another agency. In some other instances, it might be something that we can correct easily. So working closely with your supervisor so that we can figure out what the problem is and go through the, the solutions for that is really important and it helps us all do our job better. I started this presentation pointing out that all of the trainings that we're doing are part of our compliance. And so attending these trainings, ensuring that your own records are up to date is important. It is what allows all of us, um, we are each responsible for our own gold card and making sure that we are uh, compliant with the things that are part of that. And so making sure that you're attending your trainings, that you know that you've, you've made the mark for everything is important. Um, and so if you're missing a day when you know that we've uh, attended trainings or we're doing these kinds of events, talking with your supervisor and scheduling to get those um, corrected is really important. And finally, you should watch for all of the listed species that are within the CARES manual. As we've talked about, it is, you are able to make applications, you are able to set traps when you're close to those species, but you do need to be careful you do want to make sure that you're not causing harm to those animals or those plants. And if you have any questions, you can always talk to your supervisor or you can reach out to me. Thank you so much for watching the video. Look forward to answering any questions you may have.